the very first workshop at the Seeds of Change conference. Uh, my name is Hazel Malapit. I'm a senior research coordinator at the International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI. Uh, I'm based in Washington, D.C. It's my first time in Australia, first time in Canberra, so it's wonderful to be here. Uh, it's been lovely weather so far, so I'm so excited. And thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, before we start, uh, I wanted to let you know that we are recording this session. Um, a lot of our colleagues are in other workshops and want to give them an opportunity to be able to see this lecture as well. So if you would like to opt out and do not want to be seen on camera, please um, rearrange yourselves or, or, and let us know so that uh, we can make sure that, that uh, if you don't want to be in the video, that, that you're not there. Okay? Otherwise, I'll assume it's fine and just please be mindful that we are recording. Um, so for that reason as well, if, uh, in, you know, uh, we're only recording the lecture part. So once, you know, and we'll let you know once once uh, we have discussion that, that that part will not be recorded. Okay. So today we're going to talk about uh, a new set of tools uh, called the Project Level Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index uh, tools for measuring impacts on women's empowerment and for understanding impacts on women's empowerment. So this is a set of uh, tools and protocols that are being developed as part of the Gender, Agriculture, and Assets Project, or GAP2. And this is, although you have, you know, you see some names here, these are the people presenting today, but this is really drawing on a bigger team, a collective uh, work uh, and effort that's, uh, some of them are here and some of them are not, so we just want to acknowledge that this is a part of a, a broader team. With me in the room, we have uh, my co-principal investigators of GAP2, we have Agnes Kisimbi. Uh, we have, yes, we have Ruth Meinzendi. Um, we have Elena Martinez, uh, Audrey Pereira. We have uh, Deborah Rubin, uh, Emily Myers, and that's it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> For the people in the room, that's it. So these are the people, these are the resource people uh, that, that he's been drawn. Does anybody else want to say anything? No. Over to you. Over to me. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so, why are we here? So, we know that agricultural development projects, many of them aim to empower women. Uh, the question is, how do we know which interventions are working and which interventions are not working? Um, and how can we tell the difference between these? Uh, so. The entire, um, the entire uh, reason for coming up with the project level index is to answer these questions. What works to empower women? So, um, so when, when we're working with uh, different types of development projects, they, they all try to address gender and try to empower women in many different ways. So for example, we could have a project where you have uh, trainings for mothers on how to um, uh, how to uh, feed nutritious foods uh, for ch for children. You could have another project that's training informal milk traders about how to safely handle their milk products. You could have another project that's organizing women into self help groups. Maybe another project that's actually training men to be better caregivers for their children and to be better supporters of women in their caregiving roles. So the question is, which of these interventions and strategies are working and, and, and uh, how well are they working and under what conditions? Now, to answer that question, it's really very difficult unless we have some common ways to measure empowerment. And that's where the, the index comes in. Um, when, when we're working with gender, uh, when we're trying to address gender in, in our projects, there are multiple ways that we can do it. So when we're trying to, for example, close gender gaps, projects have tended to work with women in different ways. And they have usually three types of goals. So some projects are really trying to reach women. Some projects are trying to deliver benefits to women. And other projects are trying to empower women. Now, each of these goals are actually quite different. Uh, reach means including women in program activities. Benefits means 
increasing women's well-being in some way. So improving their food security, their income, their health, their nutrition. So delivering, delivering some specific benefits to women. And then empower is really beyond just reaching and benefiting them. It's actually strengthening women's ability to make strategic life choices and to put those choices into action. So actually, the empower goal is over and beyond what we usually think about when we're thinking of gender-sensitive agricultural programs. Now, why is it important to make a distinction between the different goals around gender? Well, it's important because depending on your goal, you will need different types of strategies and activities to be able to reach those goals. That also means that the types of indicators that you need to track progress will have to be very different, right? So if your goal is reach, you wouldn't use the same strategies and you wouldn't track the same indicators as you would if you were trying to empower. How does that look like? So let me give you a, a very concrete example. So here is um, a case where, let's say we have a new variety of a crop that is a nutritious crop, right? And this is a crop that's being disseminated through agricultural extension, for example, which is a very common way that we try to uh, disseminate new technologies uh, in agricultural development projects. So if the goal was reach, what does that look like? That means that you want to make sure that the technology, that the, the, new, the new variety is actually reaching women. So you want to deliver these agricultural extension services to women. How would you do that? you may want to look at and address specific gender-based constraints. So for example, you may, you may want to provide transportation if that is a key constraint for women to participate. You may want to think about conducting training during convenient times of day and convenient places where women actually can go. If that's your strategy, then your indicators would be, well, how many women are then participating? What's the proportion of women who are attending training, who are receiving extension advice, right? Uh, we're probably very familiar with this. This is a quite a common sort of approach in agricultural development programs. Now, if we're trying to deliver benefits, what does that look like? That means that, well, we want women not just to participate, we want them to get something out of it. We, we want them to, to have some benefits out of, out of the intervention. So we want to improve their well-being in some way. And what that really means is that not just, we don't want women just to attend the training, we want to make sure that women's needs, constraints, uh, and, uh, uh, and preferences are considered in the design of the training itself. So the training itself needs to be um, designed with the women's needs in mind to make sure that women do benefit. So if they come to the training, how do we ensure that they benefit? So it's not just about women showing up, it's about women really showing up to trainings or to you know, receiving services that they value and that they, they, they think are beneficial to them. How would we track progress? So here, we, can, uh, we need to measure the types of benefits that we're interested in delivering to women. So maybe we want increased yields, we increase income, you know, we can look at land use, nutrition, time use, depending on what those well-being benefits we, we want, for example, we need to measure that. But we need to measure that in a sex disaggregated way. Why? We don't want we don't want to just look at whether women are getting benefits. We want to make sure that women are benefit getting benefits that are say equal to other to men or equal to other types of women. So if we can we can look at different types of women, you can have for example nutritionally vulnerable women versus other types of women, and compare the benefits. Right. So here it's important to make comparisons if you want to say something about. Uh, benefits accruing to, to women coming out of the intervention. Okay, now if the goal is empower for this project, then again it goes beyond just reaching, it goes beyond benefiting, it means that the intervention needs to also be able to increase women's agency in production and nutrition decisions. Why those decisions? Because that's, that's, you know, that's the project, right? So um, what does this mean? in terms of strategies. It means that we need to find ways to also enhance women's decision-making power in households and communities, especially on the crops to grow. So more generally speaking, 
this is the step where you'll need to think through your theory of change. How, how are you going to empower the women? What are those steps? And take a look at those steps and see, okay, how can women's decision-making power be expanded in those key steps for them to be empowered, right? Now, if this is your goal and that's your strategy, then that also means that how do you track progress? You need to measure progress around those decision-making domains. So you may want to look at decision-making power on production, on income, on consumption. You may want to look at whether gender-based violence has decreased. That could be a signal that women are having more agency. You may want to look at their time burden. If workloads are decreasing, that may also signal uh, increasing in, in agency. And so the point here is that all of these things need to be aligned. Your goal needs to be aligned with your strategy. Your strategy needs to be aligned with your indicator. And often, where we run into trouble is when we have uh, projects that say, we're going to empower women. We're going to invite them to our trainings. And then we're going to count how many women come relative to men. So we'll measure this. But what does that do? It actually only tells you about reach. It doesn't actually give you information about the impact you're making on benefits. It also doesn't give you impact. Uh, doesn't tell you about your impact on empowerment. So you're really telling an incomplete story. On the flip side, you can have a project that's doing this, and maybe you have some strategies around you know, empowering women and enhancing their decision making. But if you're not tracking empowerment, it also means you can't tell that story of impact. You're only measuring how much benefits they're getting. You're actually not able to, you know, to, to track all the way to all the way to empowerment, right? And so what does this mean? So the implications here for project is that alignment is extremely important. We want to make sure that objectives, strategies, tactics, and indicators align. And if we want to empower, if we're seeking to empower women, then we want to think about what tactics will affect which domains of empowerment, which ones are critical to the success of your project, and focus on those aspects. For funders, it also means that alignment is important. Funders are, are interested in, in impact. And if they're looking at projects you know, to, to fund, then they need to make sure that there is, a credible, there is a credible way that impact is going to happen, right? That the activity, that the goal and the activities make sense and that they're able to track progress uh, in, the appropriate, in, in an appropriate way. So that all those things align. And often, what we really want to avoid is to have an empowerment bandwagon with no motor, right? We, there's a lot of excitement, everybody wants to empower women, but if there's no motor to drive it, if really your strategies are not around empowerment, are you, it's, it's really difficult to expect empowerment <coughs> impacts, right? Empowerment doesn't happen by accident. <coughs> you need to design for it. It's not just gonna happen, you know, we're, we're not that lucky most of the time. So, uh, so it needs to be a very sort of conscious conscious decision, it needs to be sort of baked into the program. And this is, so where does WEA come in? Where does pro WEA come in? For both projects and funders to be able to, to do this well, we need a suite of indicators that can measure empowerment both at the project level and at the portfolio level. Okay. So, so where do we begin? So our starting point for the project level women's empowerment in agriculture index is the original WEA, the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index. So this, this tool was actually launched back in 2012, so it's been a few years old. Uh, it was originally developed by USAID, IFPRI, and the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative as a monitoring and evaluation tool for Feed the Future. So it was a very specific um, type of use. So it was for the Feed the Future Initiative, and the goal was to measure inclusion of women in the agricultural sector. The, key feature of the index is that it's survey based. What does that mean? It means that it's not based on secondary data, it's actually embedded in a larger population based survey. So we have the WEA module that's embedded in a larger population based survey and it uses interviews of men and women in the same household. And what this gives us is the ability to be able to compare empowerment between men and women within households. So that's a unique feature of the index. So how is it constructed? So they basically, so the way it's an index, right? So it's one number. 
It's one number that summarizes women's empowerment in agriculture for a particular program or population. So it's one number. It's comprised of two parts. So you have a fi five domains of empowerment, which is the first sub-index. So the 5DE uh, summarizes women's achievements in the five domains. And then you have the gender parity index, or the GPI. And this summarizes women's achievements relative to the male counterpart in their same household. So those two components together make up the overall way. Um, what are the five domains? So we have five, in the original way, we have five equally weighted domains. We have production, resources, income, leadership, and time. So all the numbers here are weights. And these five domains are measured by a set of 10 indicators that are equally weighted within each domain. So I'm not going to spend too much time about this. We'll go back um, to the main ProWea later. But this is just to give you a, ba a background on where what, what we're, where we're starting from, right? This is just the starting point of the way. So the way it works is that each person in our survey answers a set of questions. So you have a male respondent, a female respondent, they answer the exact same questions. They're interviewed separately and in private. Depending on their responses, we code them as either achieving or not achieving each of the indicators. So these are all binary indicators. So they're either adequate or inadequate in each. And then we take the weighted sum using these weights so we come up with a score. So every person in the survey has an empowerment score. If their score is over 80%, they're empowered. If it's lower than that, they're disempowered. Hmm. And then we aggregate, so this is the, the, the complicated formula that aggregates the entire, uh, all the uh, responses. We aggregate them for women, we come up with a 5DE for women. We aggregate them for men, we have a 5DE for men. We compare them, we aggregate them, you come up with a GPI. And, and those are basically the building blocks of the way, right? So this methodology underlies the pro way as well. So uh, I'll not talk about the uh, details of the, um, of the formulas here, but they're in a world development article that we can share with you later. Okay, so how, what do you get out of the way? So here's um, the baseline report. Uh, this is a summary, this is the first 13 countries out of the 19 Feed the Future countries that first use the WEA in Feed the Future. So you have, um, here we have the disempowerment index. So the length of the bar is the extent of disempowerment for women. So these are just women's disempowerment uh, indices. Uh, and we have here countries, right? So these are not nationally representative. These are just based on the project areas where Feed the Future works. So keep that in mind. So these are just um, project areas for Feed the Future. Now, the first takeaway here is that context matters. Uh, oh, actually, before we get into that. So the length of the bar is the extent of disempowerment, right, of women. So the longer the bar, the more disempowered women are in, this, in that particular project area, uh, area or zone. And then the colors within the bars represent how much each of the indicators contribute to that disempowerment. So we see the relative contributions of the different uh, indicators in that disempowerment score, right? So the bigger the area, the more uh, of a constraint it is to women's disempowerment, okay? So what's the takeaway? So one is that the patterns vary across different countries, which means that different areas, there are different constraints to disempowerment, right? Dif context matters, right? And you can even look at, for example, here, where you have the bars are about the same length. So if you're just looking at the high level number, it'll give you the same number. But if you look within, you find that the composition of those bars are a bit different, which means that if you were designing a program for Nepal, you would try to address the biggest areas of disempowerment there. Uh, whereas in Zambia, those are not necessarily the same thing. So this dark green area, for example, is group membership. It's, it's very important in Nepal. In Zambia, workload is a bigger constraint, right? So this is where we can use the, the way of results as a diagnostic. The other takeaway is it just shows you how you can use way across a portfolio. You can compare different project areas and look at how those patterns of disempowerment vary across those different, um, sub -pop different populations. Now, the interesting thing is that despite these differences in the patterns, overall, if we rank, what are the top three constraints that are contributing to, 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 these, um, to women's disempowerment in these different places, we actually see some commonalities. 
So credit, workload, and group membership were found to be constraints, the top three constraints in, in, all, in many of these countries, not all, but in many of these countries. Okay. So this is also a feature, this diagnostic feature of the WEA is part of the methodology. It also underlies the pro-WEA. So you'll see that again when we get back to it later. Okay. So since the launch in 2012, uh, some version of the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index have now been used in 50, 53 countries by 86 organizations. So a lot of people have started using the WEA. And one thing I should note here is that, so this is very exciting, and I think it points to really the demand in the development community to have some <coughs> metrics around women's empowerment. Of course, users, when they try to use it for their project, they say, well, my project doesn't look like the future. I'm doing other types of interventions. I have other goals. Also, maybe I'm not working in the same places. And so it, the tool needs to be modified to address project needs. So we're calling this our, our off-label users, right? The, the original WEA was not originally designed for those users, but that's how people started using it. And that's one of the reasons why we decided to come up with ProWEA, because there was a clear demand for a tool that responded to project needs that the current tool did not have. Okay. If you Google the WEA, you're gonna find many versions. So there are multiple flavors of WEA now, and it can get confusing. So uh, first, why do we have so many versions? So since the original uh, index was launched, we have continued refining the tool. So that was really just the first attempt to measure empowerment in agriculture. And then as, you know, as it's implemented, as, as it's used, we're learning. We're learning about you know, what, what question, how questions work or not work, how we should ask them better, um, how to make it in, uh, how to make it uh, capture empowerment more, more, uh, more effectively, and so over time we're really refining these tools and are learning from previous experiences. So, so how many versions do we have so far? So we have the original way, as I said, that's intended to be a population-based tool. The very first complaint we received was that it's too long. You're interviewing men and women. We don't know how to, we're, we don't usually do that. That's going to double our costs. It's so resource heavy. Uh, and so we tried to come up with a shorter version, and that's what the abbreviated WEA is. So we did a second round of piloting. We came up with a tool that still covers the five domains, but only uses six indicators instead of 10. So it drops four indicators. It's still intended to be used as a population-based measure, so it's still embedded in a broader population-based survey, but it's around 30% shorter to implement. Okay, so that's a WEA, or abbreviated WEA. Um, now, like I said, some people started using WEA for their projects, and their projects have other goals, they're working in different contexts, and they have spe intervention-specific concerns about you know, things that they needed to measure to be able to tell if their projects are working that are not necessarily part of WEA. And so this is why we, have, uh, we needed a project-level version of the WEA, which is what bulk of what we'll talk about today. So that's the pro-WEA. Now the pro WEA is really building on the A WEA. So what we did was we started out with A WEA and asked the projects, here's the shortest version. Everybody says you want a short version. Here's the shortest version we have. How would you change it? What would you add to it? What else would you want to see in it to make it relevant for your project? So that's mm -hmm. how we got here, right? Now up until this point, WEA has really been very production focused uh, by design, but Obviously, there are also interventions that look beyond production, that look at higher nodes of the value chain. Sometimes interventions are done at the value chain level itself. So the question is, can we use, how do we measure women's empowerment at that level? Can we still use WEA? And because of that demand, we thought, ah, maybe we can. Um, let's build on pro WEA. That's the that's state of the art at the time. This is the best instrument we know how, right, we have. Uh, and then let's add on those components around value chains. Let's look at, let's add entrepreneurship, let's look at wage work, let's look at other things that may be re relevant for em measuring empowerment and value chains. So Project WEA is embedded in, in the WEA for value chain, right? Um, our, our, our goal for the future is that these two things ultimately will be used together. So it will be part of Pro WEA, so it will be used as uh, market inclusion add-on, that's what we're calling it now. But but all of this is still under construction. So this is just kind of the broad outline of where we're headed. Uh, I also should mention that in the CGIR, there are also two 
uh, modifications that build on the WEA. So there's one on livestock called the WELI, <coughs> the Women's Empowerment in Livestock Index, and a fish version, which is the Women's Empowerment in Fish Index. So WELI was developed by Ilri and then WEFI by Worldfish, and it builds on the original WEA, but again, <laughs> tries to tailor it for livestock project needs and for uh, fish project, aquaculture project needs. Um, and uh, really are, and so we're in discussion with these, with these groups and our goal really ultimately is to, to be able to harmonize the types of measures that we're using around empowerment so that we can learn from each other. Okay, so let me hand off to Eleni. The WEA had some important advantages. It looked at women's empowerment across five domains. It was a standardized measure that was internationally validated and it gave us the ability to look at and diagnose gaps in empowerment. But we had a lot of projects adapting it to their specific needs. And as Hazel was saying, projects wanted a measure that was more adaptable to context. They wanted a measure that looked at some areas that are more, that are of interest to specific projects like mobility, domestic violence, um, inter-household harmony. We also had a lot of projects that were interested in health and nutrition outcomes that were interested in looking at empowering these domains, and of course, a shorter interview time. So that led us to start creating the project level WEA, which we call ProWEA. So ProWEA is made up of first a set of core modules that we envision all projects that implement ProWEA would use these core modules. This includes both quantitative modules and a set of qualitative protocols. And then there's also a set of standardized add-ons based on the project's interests and needs. So we have one related to empowerment and nutrition and health, one that provides some more detail for livestock-focused projects, and one that looks at market inclusion at different nodes of the value chain. So a little later we'll hear more about some of these add-on modules. So as Hazel said, ProEA is being developed through a project called the Gender, Agriculture, and Assets Project, Phase 2. And this project uses a portfolio approach to creating a new measure for women's empowerment. So what do I mean by portfolio? We have a group of 13 partner projects. They're all agricultural development projects in nine different countries in Africa and Asia that are piloting the quantitative and qualitative ProEA protocols as part of this project. And this approach really helps us to understand in a variety of different projects what works well, what doesn't work, what strategies are working well and which strategies aren't working. And it also helps us move towards a measure that's comparable across a portfolio of projects. So this gives you an idea of the variety of projects that are in our GAP2 portfolio. All of the projects have interventions related to crops or livestock or both. And they're all interested in outcomes related to nutrition, and some of them are also measuring outcomes related to income. And they're all set up as impact evaluations using a variety of different designs. And of course, all of them are undertaking qualitative work related to ProEA, as well as implementing the draft quantitative index. And one big advantage of using a portfolio is they're using a variety of combinations of strategies to empower women. So some projects are providing goods and services, some are strengthening organizations, groups, associations, some are building knowledge and skills, might be related to agricultural extension or nutrition education, and some are trying to influence gender norms in the communities where they work. And I've highlighted in blue here some of the most popular strategies that are used across our portfolio. Now I'm gonna get into a bit more of the nitty gritty of what is in ProWEA and how do we think about empowerment in WEA. So there are a lot of ways to define empowerment, but across all of our versions of WEA, we use Nyla Kabir's definition of empowerment as a process of change across three interrelated dimensions, resources, agency, and achievements where resources are those human, social, and economic resources that enhance a person's ability to make choices. Agency is the ability to set your own goals and act upon them. And then achievements are actually achieving those goals, so having higher income or having better health. And we know that there are pretty well-developed ways to measure resources and to measure achievements. So in WEA, we focus on measuring agency. And specifically, we measure three types of agency in all versions of WEA, including ProEA. So we look at intrinsic agency. This is, we call this power within. This is 
a person's internal sense of agency, their self-confidence and self-respect. We look at instrumental agency or power two. This is the ability to make decisions in one's own best interest. And we look at collective agency, which is the power that we get when we act together with other people. And so as Hazel mentioned, in the original WEO, we had five domains that were more topical. But in pro WEO, we wanted to make the connection to these theories of empowerment even more evident. So in pro WEO, our three domains of empowerment are these three types of agency. And across the three types of agency, we measure 12 different indicators. So in intrinsic agency, we look at autonomy in income, self-efficacy, attitudes about domestic violence, and respect among household members. In instrumental agency, we look at input and productive decisions, ownership of land and other household assets, control over use of income, access to and decisions on financial services like financial accounts and credit, um, work balance, and visiting important locations in the community. And in collective agency, we look at two indicators, active membership in groups and membership in groups that are influential in the community. So in the original WEA, the indicators were evenly weighted within each of the five domains. In pro WEA, we actually evenly weight the indicators across the whole set. So each of these indicators receives a 112th weight. And we consider a person empowered under PROWEA if they're adequate in 75% or at least 9 out of 12 of these indicators. And like WEA, each of these indicators has a threshold for adequacy. So for example, in group membership, a person has to say they're an active member of at least one community group to be considered adequate in that binary indicator. And like WEA, PROWEA is made up of two sub-indices. We have the three domains of empowerment, which looks at women's achievements across all 12 indicators. And we have the gender parity index, which compares women's achievements to the male interviewed in their household. And slightly differently from WEA, in WEA, you always interview the primary male and female decision makers in the household. But for pro WEA, a project might choose to interview a different male-female pair in the household depending on who they think will benefit from their intervention or who their project beneficiaries are. So how do we look at all of these data? First thing most people think of doing is looking at what percentage of people are adequate in each indicator. So for example, this is our indicator of mobility, visiting important locations, and you can see in the green on top, nearly 80% of men in our pilot data were adequate, while many fewer women were, were adequate. But ProAid gives us a lot more value than just a dashboard of indicators. So for example, we can look across all 12 indicators at how many indicators people didn't reach the threshold for adequacy in. So here on the x-axis, I'm looking at number of inadequacies. That means the number of indicators the individual did not reach the threshold for. So overall, we can see this green is men and the purple is women. So men in general had fewer inadequacies than women. This probably doesn't surprise us very much. Then we can look at our empowerment thresholds. Remember I said someone has to be adequate in at least nine of 12 indicators to be empowered. So the people in this box who have four or more inadequacies, these are the people considered disempowered under PROWEA. So again, we can see that more women are disempowered than men, but also the women who are disempowered tend to have more inadequacies than the men who are disempowered. We call this the intensity of disempowerment. And that 3DE score, tells us both how many women were disempowered and how disempowered they were. And this is really important because you might have a sample where, you might have two groups where the same percentage of women are disempowered, but one group may have women who are much more disempowered than the other group, and that's important for us to understand. So this is an example of how we would portray some of our pilot results in a report. So you could look at the three domains of empowerment. You see that in our pilot data, men were more empowered than women. And you can also look at, say, what percentage of men and women achieved empowerment in your sample. You can look at the gender parity index and what percentage of households achieved gender parity. We consider gender parity to be <coughs> when either the woman is empowered or she's as empowered as the man in her household. And then we can combine those two sub-indices to get the overall PROWEA score. 
Finally, as Hazel was pointing out in the original WEA results, we can also look at proportional contributions to disempowerment using PROWEA. So here, instead of comparing countries, I'm comparing men and women in our pilot data. So again, on the y-axis, we're looking at total disempowerment. This is kind of the opposite of your 3DE score. So the total depth of the bars is total disempowerment. You can see women are more disempowered than men. And then the size of each of these colored blocks is the proportional contribution to disempowerment of each indicator. So if you look at the purple ones at the bottom, you can see for both men and women in these pilot data, the indicators of group membership were the largest contributors to disempowerment. But we can also use this type of chart to draw out differences between men and women. So if you look at these maroon bars, that's our indicator of mobility. You can see that mobility was a much bigger um, contributor to disempowerment for women than it was for men. And this can help us understand what types of interventions might be useful <coughs> to design for your group. Now I'm going to hand it over to Audrey, who's going to tell you what presented is what we like to refer to as the core ProWEA, so the three domains, 12 indicators, which consist of the quantitative survey modules and the qualitative protocols. In addition to that core ProWEA, we're in the process of developing standardized add-on modules depending on project needs for different types of ag agricultural projects. So for example, we have a health and nutrition module for um, agricultural development projects with nutrition sensitive objectives. We have a livestock enhanced module for livestock projects and a market inclusion module um, for value chains projects. So for the corporal way, you can compare that across different types of ag agricultural projects. And then for these add-on modules, the idea is to come up with a suite of indicators that can be used, for example, one livestock project with another livestock project. So we're really measuring agency in these subtopics sub in these add-on modules. So why was there a need for a uh, health and nutrition module? So many agricultural development projects also have nutrition sensitive pathways, and specifically they're often maternal and child health focused. Um, so one of the pathways can be a project wants to increase women's control of income, and that leads to the household buying more, um, or the woman buying more food and or health products, for example. And this module is really capturing agency around health and nutrition. So there were uh, three, six projects across three countries. So all the projects in purple and green over here piloted the ProWEA, the core ProWEA, and the ones in green also piloted the health and nutrition module. So there were three in Bangladesh, two in Burkina Faso, and one in Mali. And in initial discussions with these projects, there were three characteristics that were relevant for inclusion in this module. One, the module had to capture the food, health, and care paradigm that these projects used. It had to be life cycle sensitive, specifically for maternal and young child health. And the third was a lot of these projects were livestock focused and they had specific objectives on animal sourced foods, like increasing the consumption of milk, eat, milk, eggs, and meat. And it was important that this module captured that. So the health and nutrition module is administered to women only, and it's divided into two parts. The first asks uh, questions around decision making. So we start off with who in the household makes decisions about a certain topic, and the respondent can answer up to three household members, including herself. But when we looked at the data for this, um, or, and in discussions, it came up that a large proportion of the women were actually, actually reported making the decisions, but we were unsure whether they actually had a voice in, this, in the decision or um, they were just being told what to say or do. So we added a second question, which is, to what extent does she participate in this decision? And we asked these questions about women's own health. So for example, healthcare, rest and work, diet and health during pregnancy and lactation, and animal source foods, and on child's health as well. So animal source foods, healthcare, and breastfeeding and weaning. The second part of the health and nutrition module asks questions on um, food and health related products. So a woman's decision to uh, whether she has the ability to decide to purchase key foods and health products. Or sometimes women can acquire these products in different uh, products in different means instead of just purchasing them, so through someone else. So we also ask about that. So to go from these questions to develop the indicators, we went through a few steps. So first we used cognitive interviewing to improve the question structure. We used psychometric analyses to identify the different domains, and then also define adequacy and cutoffs. And um, we eliminated redundant questions and we reduced the module by about one third. So 
here are the, there are seven health and nutrition indicators over here. So for example, the top two in purple over there are decisions about a woman's own health and diet. One is specific and one is um, about pregnancy. Oh, sorry, one is general and one is more specific about pregnancy. And a woman, um, Elena mentioned the different thresholds and cutoffs. So in these <coughs> indicators, a woman is adequate if she decided, if she decided solely or she felt she could participate in the decision to at least a medium extent. So for example, the first one in purple over there, the decisions about own health and diet, a woman is adequate in this indicator if she decided solely or felt she could decide or felt she could participate in the decision to at least a medium extent on resting when ill and uh, foods to prepare and foods to eat. Um, the two in yellow up here on the left are decisions about child's diet and decisions on breastfeeding and weaning. The one in red is about seeking healthcare. So this is for herself and her child, both preventive and um, when there's an illness. And the two in green are about, are about decisions to purchase food and, health and pro food and health products, or if she can access them through means other than purchase. So just to wrap up and give you an idea of what this shows, this graph shows you the percent of women who achieve ad um, adequacy in these indicators. These are pooled estimates, just averages across the six projects. So for example, we find that 51% um, of women are adequate in making decisions about their own health and diet uh, during pregnancy, but only 34 are adequate in this for uh, decisions around their child's diet. So this really shows you where projects have room to improve. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so let's segue into talking about the qualitative work that we've done so far for Kauea. Um, so first, we really wanted to give you an idea of why we chose to pursue mixed methods in developing the ProWea quantitative survey instrument. Um, the first of which is that we want to be able to contextualize the quantitative you know, ProWea findings as well as other quantitative findings that would be included in the larger survey you know, that people are conducting as they also implement ProWea. Um, and so really the reason why is because we want to understand the overall context in which people are, um, you know, working in agriculture, um, you know, working in rural context, and not just the person and their set of individual <coughs> quantitative observations. Um, additionally, we want to be able to understand project impacts from participants' perspective. So, you know, do the people that we're seeking, um, are the people who are beneficiaries, do they actually feel like the intervention has made a positive change? Um, how does the intervention affect you know, resources, agency, achievement, um, you know, as outlined in Kabir's framework? And ultimately, um, we also are using the qualitative methods to validate the pro -wea. So, you know, when we think about empowerment, does it overlap with what um, you know, program participants you know, think empowerment is? Um, as well as understanding if the different domains and indicators we've selected in the quantitative work actually reflect what's important um, you know, to the people that we're including in our survey. So we have used several different qualitative methods or protocols as listed here. Um, not all of the projects in the GAP2 portfolio have used all of them um, you know, because of any number of reasons. Um, but really, we offered like a whole suite of qualitative protocols because we want to get at that comprehensive understanding of the context, not the individual, as I highlighted previously. Um, so this here is a list of eight projects in the GAP2 portfolio. Um, and these are the ones that have already conducted their qualitative research and have findings available uh, that my colleagues will discuss in further detail in a minute. Um, so it's not the entire portfolio. It's most of um, so as mentioned earlier, there's a few different types of agency that are included in the quantitative survey instrument. Again, intrinsic, instrumental, and collective. And um, just to summarize what we found in the qualitative work from those eight projects I just mentioned, you know, intrinsic agency comes through as people talking about, oh, you know, someone being strong or courageous or moral. Um, instrumental agency shows up uh, when our you know, qualitative participants talk about, you know, people who are hard workers, people who make good decisions. Um, one of the more interesting findings that we'll go into more detail in a moment is about how property rights can, um, you know, confirm um, or affirm, I should say, social relationships, but also require 
exercise of agency. And that gets back to one of the earlier questions um, in the question and answer session we had um, about you know, decision making and not just you know, having an asset, but how that asset affects you know, their relationships with people and decision making. Um, collective agency often shows up as um, you know, an empowered person being someone who's able to lift the burden and help others. Um, particularly for women, um, you know, that's women who are able to help their husbands financially, um, you know, parents who can provide for their children, you know, caring for elderly parents, as well as just other community members. Um, there's also a fourth type of power that we didn't introduce earlier because it's not included in the pro wea which is coercive power or power over, which is negative. Um, and when we did ask about power over others in the qualitative work, it was always negative um, in the first participant's view as well. Um, and so it would not be acceptable for people, particularly women, to have control over men um, or other women. So with that, I'd like to hand over our discussion, our presentation to Dee. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm going to give you, since many of us are visiting here in Australia, I'm going to give you the tourist's view of all of the detailed data that we have collected. So the next few slides are going to present, I'm sorry, in a rather superficial manner, um, what it is that we have learned from the people that we have been working with. And then my colleagues will continue with some of our analysis over what it is that <coughs> people are saying actually means. So as Emily introduced, we looked at several different types of agency in the qualitative work. The first one here that we're going to talk about is intrinsic agency, looking at what that means in terms of intra-household dynamics. So the first point um, is a, a sort of negative one. It was one that surprised us, this notion of submission. And it really centers on the idea of respect, which we found very, um, very often represented when people talked about empowerment. They talked about women who are respected, women who are um, looked upon well in the community, who are admired. But part of that is having to deal themselves with the idea of being able to follow social norms, some of which encourage a type of submission of women. So how do you walk that line to be empowered and yet follow a norm which is expecting a somewhat submissive role. And women talked about this in terms of being able to find for themselves that way to walk that line. So while um, in some places like Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, also Tanzania, uh, there was an expression of men wanting women to be very submissive. The women themselves talked about it in terms of finding a way to maintain their own respect while meeting social norms about what an appropriate wifely role was. And in Ethiopia in particular, the project, the uh, J.P. Rui project, uh, in recounted that there were a lot of changes in the way that men came to respect women more and expected <coughs> less amount of submissiveness as a result of the project. So this is a really interesting finding. We're not, we're not done with this one. I think it needs a lot of layers um, still to be uh, developed. Um, in the Kenya case, we also found a different direction in which women's empowerment was very much involved with men's support of their efforts. So among the milk traders, we found that there were cases where men um, <coughs> provided funding to the women to be able to allow them to work in the milk trade. So that inter-household relationship of support was really important for providing the context for women to feel empowered. Um, among other household members, as, as Ruth actually just mentioned, it was also really important to understand what the relationships were between indigenous households, the co-wives, or in other types of situations, especially in Asia, where the mother-in-law is a very important role, how those relationships can either constrain or um, promote women's empowerment and their ability to make decisions over their own lives. Another area in which intrinsic agency shows up, in which we were talking about it, is with respect to violence within the household, especially in intimate partner violence. 
Um, this is something which is very prevalent in some areas. We were not measuring or asking about the experiences of individuals themselves of intimate partner violence, but about the attitudes towards it. Um, in certain cases, in Tanzania, women reported that men used intimate partner violence as a way of controlling the women. Um, but at the same time, in oftentimes in community groups, it was possible to mobilize the group to be able to confront men who were being violent to their, to their wives and to be able to um, change that behavior through group activities. In instrumental agency, we were talking about the type of um, ability to make decisions over particular events, particularly with respect to agricultural production, since these were all rural communities. It was very important um, to understand that there were different patterns of men and women in the kinds of decisions that they made over resources. So a very common pattern I'm sure you're all familiar with is that women often are given or take the power uh, to make decisions over poultry, over small livestock, over small amounts of produce that they take to the market. Whereas typically, in many areas, men are the ones who are making the decisions over the larger amounts of produce or the larger animals. Um, but again, this depends on the inter-household dynamics and the way in which resources are allocated within the household and the different ways in which different members of the household are able to make decisions. Um, we found that the range of joint decision making is empowering when men and women are able to make decisions together and that uh, this was quite different. Sometimes it was uh, contradictory. So we had a case in Bangladesh where people were talking about how now um, in the modern world today that more and more it's acceptable for men and women to make decisions together over different household activities. Um, in uh, another situation in Nepal, and we've seen this in other cases, the influence of migration and the use of technology is a really interesting point in changing the way in which people are able to make decisions. So now that you have your cell phone, um, even if the husband is working somewhere else and the wife is back in the village, you can um, make a decision together about something. In terms of ownership and control over resources, and there was a question about this, we're, we're looking here at the decisions about or over those resources and the recognition that the notion of ownership is so different in different places it's, that you really need to understand this. So when we're asking these questions, we're not simply asking about who is the titular owner, who has land rights according to the um, national legislation, but to try to understand what it is that people are speaking about when they're speaking about ownership um, for themselves. So for example, among the Maasai, it was very common for both men and women to say that they owned land, even though they are <coughs> largely pastoral communities. So they didn't have land in terms of the national um, legal title, but they still were able to talk about ownership themselves. Um, and a similar situation that we found in, in Ethiopia, again, where uh, the project was, was changing some of those patterns. Similarly, for decisions over control of income, um, the larger pattern that we were seeing generally, again, not a surprise, is that women tend to have greater control over income that they themselves have earned, whereas men tend to control how, uh, income that is considered part of the household. But there's some um, interesting cases about this. Uh, in, in, in some situations, particularly in Nepal, there's household resources, but there's also individual resources and the kinds of rights that you can um, that you can uh, exercise <coughs> over those different types of property are quite different. So women have control over their individual property, but they don't necessarily have control over the communal property. Um, in, again, in uh, Bangladesh, we found these contradictory notions where some men were, they tended to be older men, um, expressed the point of view of saying that uh, a man who is only uh, living off of his wife's income is not really a man, but he has to tolerate <coughs> his wife. 
whereas others say that women absolutely should not be <coughs> earning income. Um, again, the, the variation is something that we're really interested in and trying to understand to be able to make more general statements about. For time and the ability to uh, manage your own time, again, this is something um, that we saw a fair amount of variation in, but also some similarity. Certainly you have changes over the seasonality in terms of who does what at different points in time, um, but also within the, uh, the notion that in, in terms of within the household, the different gender roles, have you um, able to do different things at different times or have different control over your time? So this notion of the supportive aspect of intra-household roles that we talked about earlier comes out with respect to time where men may contribute to working in the household and freeing up some of women's time. The point at the bottom um, that having more control over your time is empowering is a very important one and one that people expressed in a range of situations and I think one that we can also appreciate. I think all of us would like to have a little bit more control over our time um, even if it doesn't necessarily reduce the work we have to do. On the issue of mobility and the ability to control where you can go and with whom, we found that um, one of the issues was that many times you would not be able to go alone as a woman to a particular place, to the market or else outside the village, but that you could go with other people. So how to understand that? Is that disempowering if you have to go with other people or is it empowering because you can go with the group? It's this question of how do we understand collective agency that was raised already in response to a question. Um, and again, the importance of having that joint discussion about uh, the ability to be able to move uh, from place to place so that, as the quote says for uh, Tanzania, women um, often are constricted in their travel among in the Maasai community, um, but having good relationships with one husband opens up that possibility. Okay, I think we are, oh, I have one more. Um, unless Ruth would like to take collective agency. Um, so the last uh, type of agency that we were talking about, collective agency, um, as was said actually by, uh, by Hazel earlier that uh, in the original way of, we were talking about agency in terms of leadership in groups. Here we're trying to understand from the people themselves about the importance of working with groups, how did they understand it? Um, and this, this question of uh, whether or not group membership is empowering or whether some types of group membership actually can reinforce hierarchies was one of the things that came out, one of the themes. So a lot of times in development projects we hear now that the importance of groups is that they can be empowering, but when because you're getting people together, you're, you're offering different opportunities, whether it's access to fertilizer or credit or something. But women themselves would say that if they didn't have the right sort of clothing or if they didn't have enough money to be able to get to the place where the group is meeting, that it could actually reinforce a kind of social hierarchy. So being aware of that tension was something that came out as very important for people. Okay. I will now turn it over to Ruth. Well, part of what we were doing in all of this, Dee's done a really nice job of going through the interpretations and the perspectives that the qualitative gave us about people's own perceptions of these different indicators. <coughs> but we also, out of the, the whole qualitative, we got a sense of how the indicators are interrelated. And so, for example, I ended up calling it time becomes a tether. Your mobility is not affected only by your, uh, whether you have to get permission to travel, but it's, it's whether you have these household responsibilities that are tying you back and not <coughs> letting you travel, or whether, uh, and then that in turn may limit your ability to earn income, 
which then cycles back and affects your household relationships. So, uh, and lack of transport, again, can, can limit mobility. And it's not just transport per se, but socially acceptable transport for women. Because a man may be able to ride on the top of a lorry, but that's not acceptable for a woman to do. Um, again, the example from the Maasai shows that intra-household relations and trust affect mobility and income generation. The group membership, all of these are interconnected. What that means is that if you are a project and you are trying to, say, promote group membership, you need to think through that it may not be enough to just have groups that meet, but that you have to think through, well, what's it going to take for women to be able to participate in that? Also, in Nepal, um, things like women often hide income from others in their family, and the, the more trust there is within the family, the, the less likely they are to hide those in, that income or those assets. And um, the other thing that came out really strongly from the qualitative, especially in, in South Asia, was the importance that the family is, is not just the relationship with the husband, but it's the whole extended family. And relations with mother-in-laws are often more disempowering than relations with husbands. So, you know, these kinds of things. Um, and then domination over information related to cell phone ownership, but also who this, the extension workers talk to. All of these are kind of interrelationships. So, in terms of the local understandings of empowerment, the, um, there were some commonalities. <laughs> the first big commonality is that it's really hard to translate empowerment. And in retrospect, I think what we're recommending is don't try. Don't try to translate empowerment because in a lot of places there is not an equivalent term. Or if there is, it's going, it's NGO speak. So if you go into Nepal and you ask about empowerment, you, in an area, there are so many NGOs that have gone in with trainings on empowerment and they will give you, this is the right answer, right? Because that's what all our trainings said. So instead, take the definition of what you think of women who are able to make decisions and act on them and use that as, so, but when we did find that, economic status was the number one thing that surfaced. Being able to take care of yourself and your immediate family especially. But things that we don't often, that surface very highly there, are being well-dressed and having a good appearance. That is, that is the mark of an empowered woman, and it is empowering because then you can go and attend meetings and such. The other really strong thing that comes across in all of this is that empowerment is relational. It's not an individual thing. You are, women there, in almost all of these cases, were defined in terms of relationships to others. And um, now, taking care of others in the family and community, having the means and status to do that, but also connections to others, really is empowering. Again, like Emily said, <coughs> power over others was never seen in a positive light. Um, the other thing, there were some differences, and Dee highlighted a lot of these tensions about how both men and women were sometimes ambivalent about how empowered women were viewed. Um, sometimes it's good that they can help lift the burden, but sometimes that's threatening. Um, following social norms, sometimes younger women were seen as more empowered, sometimes you could only be empowered when you were older. And whether you were more empowered if you were unmarried or others. Now, when we talk, sorry, um, when community, we, um, you saw that, you know, from the Kabir framework, there are these different interpretations. What I would say is the first type of 
set of attributes that came out from the community interpretations were, were related to achievements. Second, two resources. Agency was not the first thing that people came up with in terms of uh, descriptions of empowered women. And that's probably agencies harder for me to think about than achievements or, or resources. Um, so I think that's um, capturing that, but there were a number of uh, examples of where women exercise agency, even in how they follow social norms and are seen to be a hard worker and all, um, that were insightful. So the, in terms of the implications for ProWEA, it's an iterative process between the qualitative and the quantitative. But um, I think these emic, these internal, are, are locally defined pers perspectives on empowerment, um, were, have enriched our attempts to measure. So each component of the empowerment is relational, not just <coughs> you know, taking the individual out of society. Decision making. Joint decision making is counted as empowered in the pro way because we found that in the qualitative, women often did not value making the decisions by themselves. That actually exposed you to vulnerability, in, in, especially in South Asia. Um, and then the benefit of empowerment is also relational. It's not, does it just benefit you? It benefits those around you. Um, and you can use that social capital also to help yourself, for example, in addressing intimate partner violence. Um, and then these interconnections between the dimensions of empowerment also surfaced a lot in the quality. So although the qualitative doesn't necessarily show up in the, the indicator values or the index values, um, the projects did often report that the qualitative study was really important as a source of insights for both how, um, how empowerment was perceived, but also the um, insights for how interventions needed to work. That to empower women, you also had to work with men, for example. Um, that and you know, tracing down when women aren't using the services, looking within the household for why. Um, and that was, uh, you know, that you need to understand how she operates within her household and community to affect her life. So uh, with that, we've got a lot of resources on this.